Hi, I'm Sean Chamberlain. Welcome to Exploring the World Ocean. In today's lecture, we're going to talk about ocean chemistry. If you think about it, ocean chemistry is, well, right at your fingertips in your own kitchen. From the sea salt you might use to season your food, to even making a glass of lemonade, or a hot cup of tea. Even boiling an egg is an act of chemistry and washing the dishes afterwards. All good chemistry. Even eating a cookie is an act of chemistry. Especially when you digest it. Scientists exploring the world ocean and the world of ocean chemistry want to know why is the ocean salty? What is it that makes the ocean, it gives the ocean its salty content? What controls the salinity of the world ocean? How does it get salty? And how does it remain fairly constant? in its salinity. And what are humans doing to change the chemistry of the ocean? All of these things we'll look at in this lecture. Well, before we go, we need to talk about an important word that oceanographers use, in fact, that they've used for over the last hundred years or so. In the 19th century, a French oceanographer, Joseph Louis Gay Lussac, coined the term water column to describe water from its surface to a particular depth. This water column looks something like this. But remember, it's just an imaginary column of water. If you look up at the ceiling and imagine that as the surface of the ocean and let your eye fall down to the floor, which you can imagine is the floor of the ocean, your eye has circumscribed what we might call the water column. Again, it's an imaginary column of water from the surface of the ocean to a particular depth. And oceanographers use that word quite often because it's a convenient way to describe the change in properties like temperature or salinity or even the distribution of organisms from the surface to a particular depth. Chemistry is defined as the study of matter. Matter being all that stuff you see around you. The things that make up you and make up our planet and indeed the universe. Chemistry involves the study of the composition of that matter, what it's made out of, how it's put together, how it behaves, what kind of properties it has. In our terms, chemistry involves really changes in the composition of matter. For example, dissolving salt in water, making rock candy, making a glass of, well, lemonade. All of that's chemistry. As we've already talked about, the basic unit of matter is the atom. We know that atoms are made up of protons and neutrons in their nucleus, surrounded by one or more electrons. Well, it turns out that on Earth there are about 90 different kinds of atoms, and those kinds of atoms we call elements. Elements are composed of a single type of atom. And if you think about it, atoms are really the building blocks, or if I may, the Lego pieces that make up everything that we see and feel and everything that's matter on our planet. If we, just to review the basic parts of an atom, the nucleus of the atom, again, being made up of the proton and the neutron, the electron surrounding the nucleus, and as you recall, it's changes in the numbers of neutrons that determine whether a particular atom is a radioactive atom or a stable isotope. And those are terms we want to remember because we continue to come back to those throughout the semester. Well, you'll hear us use, and you'll read in the book, this term substances. Well, it's just a really broad way to refer to elements and compounds and really anything that has a distinct chemical formula. As I've already said, elements are those substances that can't be divided into anything else. They are the basic building blocks of matter. And compounds are substances composed of two or more types of atoms. Water is a compound, for example, composed of the elements hydrogen and oxygen. Well, chemists, being an organized lot, like to put things together in tables. And this is a table of all the elements, all the known elements, and perhaps a few missing even, in our, on our planet. As it turns out, only about 89 or 90 of these elements are naturally occurring. And as it turns out as well, there's only a few that we'll focus on in this course. This periodic table of the elements is arranged to give chemists some idea of how elements react, but we're gonna not really pay much attention to that aspect of the table. What I'd like you to do in studying this table is look at a few of the major elements. Those that are 
surrounded in purple boxes, uh, sodium, magnesium, potassium, calcium, strontium, fluorine, chloride, bromine, boron, and even carbon. Those are the major elements in seawater. Most of what we find in seawater, 99.9% .9 is made up of these elements. These other elements that are surrounded in orange boxes, those are the ones that are important to living organisms. And I want to be clear, when you think about living organisms in the ocean, most of us probably think of flipper or shamu, or we think of the fish we ate the other night. As it turns out, most of life in the ocean is, well, microscopic. You can't see it. Microbes dominate the ocean, both in terms of their biomass, their numbers, and really in their importance. So it's a good idea to start thinking about the ocean in terms of its microorganisms, because in reality, the way the ocean works depends upon the, those tiny little microscopic organisms that really create and activate the chemistry of the ocean, as, long as, as well as a number of other things. So when I talk about elements that are important to organisms, I'm really talking about elements that are important to those microbes. Well, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention something about the chemical properties of water itself. And as it turns out, water, more than any other substance on our planet, dissolves more things than anything else. That's why we call it the universal solvent. A solvent is something that dissolves something else. And as it turns out, water dissolves more something else's than any other compound on Earth. Part of the reason why it does that is because water is what we call a polar molecule. Now that doesn't mean it has strange behavioral properties and it doesn't even mean that we only find it at the poles. What that means is that the two ends of the atom or the two ends of the molecule have different electrical charges. One end of the molecule has a positive charge. The other end has a negative charge as we'll see. Here is the oxygen atom, and here are the two hydrogen atoms to which it's combined. And it's this configuration of H2O, or water, that gives it an electronegative end and an electropositive end. Now, this structure of water gives it really a lot of interesting properties that are really not too complicated, but beyond the scope of what we want to go into in our course here. So I'll just leave it to other teachers or leave it to the chemists to explain those really interesting properties. We really don't need to go into covalent bonds and hydrogen bonds to understand how water works and to understand the concepts we wish to use later on in the semester. So we'll leave that part to the experts and other teachers that are probably better teaching about chemistry than I.